than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, still uh, the administrative stuff is the same stuff as we uh, talk about on uh, Monday. Project 3 is due on November the 14th, uh, Sunday, as well as homework is actually uh, due uh, today, homework 4. Uh, and, and as you know, we're actually going to have the additional office hour hold on this Saturday. Uh, but the way to treat this is that you should actually really try to uh, finish the project before even uh, Saturday, right? And, and if Saturday comes and you really have some last one or two issues you really couldn't solve, you can go to the office hour as the last resort, right? And if you save lots of questions um, on Saturday and hope you can solve that in a day, that's gonna to be tough, <laughs> all right? So uh, for the upcoming database talk, and on, on next Monday, we actually have uh, this company, I think it's the co-founder of this company, uh, Fluri, are going to come talk about their uh, cl cloud native ledger graph database. So ledger, I think here ledger just means uh, blockchain, right? So it's cloud, blockchain, graph, all kind of hot topics. So you could check it out if you are interested. Okay, so just to pick up from what we talked about last class, right? Last class, we started to talk about this logging and recovery mechanism to guarantee these three properties of ACID, right? Guarantee automaticity, consistency, as well as the durability. And we say that there are at high level, there are two steps of this logging and recovery process. The first, obviously, is called logging, which will be the additional steps you have to perform while the system is executing transaction normally, right? Metadata, uh, redo, and undo information, etc. Then the second part would just be uh, the recovery step that the algorithm or mechanism need to go through after you come back from a crash, right? So that you can put the database back into a correct state. <laughs> and last class, we are focusing on the uh, first part uh, mainly, right? And the one part that we didn't really finish last class, we talk about the additional information or in other words, the logging that we need to write uh, to keep track of the metadata and changes, et cetera, is that while we are writing these logs, right, to make sure that they have, have enough information uh, come back after, we, uh, after a crash, this log can actually just grow forever, right? If the database system don't do anything about it, then, I mean, let's say the database is running for a year, then you just have a year of change log, which could even be bigger than the original data you have, right? So I mean, this could uh, take up lots of space, and over time, it could be uh, problematic. So one way to address this, uh, we, and, and used in the, in the database system, is called uh, checkpointing, which essentially means that you take a consistent snapshot of the content of the database periodically, right? So that after a snapshot, you can throw away, not everything, but throw away most of the stuff before the checkpoint. And then after you come back from a crash, right? Assuming you crash, then you don't need to look at everything either, right? Roughly, you only need to look at things after the checkpoint, but actually for correctness reason, you still have to look at some stuff before the checkpoint. And we'll get to in the details later, right? <laughs> so the high level idea is to take consistent snapshot periodically so that you can throw away old logs. So what do you need to do uh, when you are do, when you're doing a checkpoint? Um, at a high level, you just do uh, these following steps, three steps, right? Essentially, first, you would actually need to uh, write all your logs currently, I mean, your right hand log buffer onto the disk, right? And then after that, you're just going to uh, write all the dirty pages in your buffer pool onto the disk as well, right? So that's why actually this order is important because last time we talked, we said that while we are generating those logs, and modify the content of the database, we always need to generate log records first before we actually go and modify the page in the buffer pool, right? And here is the same order, right? You, you write all the log records first, and then you write all the uh, contents in the uh, buffer pool with all the data pages. And then lastly, you just write a checkpoint entry uh, to the log record and flush that. So then you just have a checkpoint. So we'll give you a very simple example here, <laughs> right? So here, I mean, uh, assuming that uh, we have uh, this, oh, actually, before getting into the detail, we just assume a simple checkpoint strategy, right? Where we just actually, uh, when we are doing this checkpoint, we just uh, pause the entire database and perform this um, log flushing as well as uh, buffer pool flushing. And we'll talk about a more uh, optimized strategy later in this class. 
But in this example, simple example, right, we have uh, two or uh, three transactions, right? Transaction one, transaction two, transaction three. And then before this checkpoint that we are taking, transaction one, we assume it has committed, and then transaction both transaction two and transaction three has started, right? But transaction two, transaction two only commits after you take the point, take the checkpoint. And say at the end of uh, these uh, logs, uh, this uh, database um, crashed due to various reasons. So what will happen here, right? So the first is that any transactions that have committed before the checkpoint, we could just actually ignore them, right? We don't actually need to recover them, redo, undo, whatever, because we have all the changes of this committed transaction already flushed onto the disk. I mean, the 30 pages, right, already written to the uh, database uh, pages uh, before the checkpoint happened, right? And after the checkpoint, we know that all the changes have been persistent. So for transaction uh, two and three, right, they didn't really uh, finish uh, the commit before the uh, checkpoint starts. So what do we need to do to them? Well, because transaction T2 has already been uh, committed, then we actually need to reapply all the changes of this transaction back to the database system when we come back from a crash, right? Because we already tell the outside world D2 has committed. We, to, we need to make sure that the content of D2 is persistent. And then for uh, transaction T3, because it has not actually not finished, then before the system crash, some dirty pages, I mean, written by transaction T3 may already flush to disk, right? Because we have already have the log record T3 show up in the right hand log. So after that, the dirty pages that contain this modification of T3 in the database content could also be written to the disk already, right? So after we come back, we need to make sure that all those changes of T3 being undone. So this, at high level, will happen. We'll get to uh, more details when we talk about recovery in this class, all right? So that's the high level, uh, the idea of checkpointing to reduce the log size. So uh, there are a few issues, obviously, right? with that the simple approach I just talked about. The most obvious one is that if you want to ensure a atomic or like a consistent write of all these log records as well as all those uh, dirty pages while you're taking checkpoint, you, a simple approach is just to stop. But that obviously will block users from executing transaction in the database and which would be bad for performance. And even after you come back from a crash, even though you have the checkpoint, uh, if you are not doing it carefully, you actually still need to scan quite some records even before the checkpoint as well, right? Because like, like we saw in the last example, there are actually uh, changes from T2, for example, right? That has, um, yeah, because you, yeah, from T2, you have to redo, right? Because uh, the, 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 the T2 only commits after the checkpoint begin. And for example, if T3, uh, did any modifications before the checkpoint, you have to undo that as well, right? Even though, because your checkpoint may have that. And also, there's also the challenge of um, how often do you do the checkpoint, right? Essentially, at a high level, if you are doing checkpointing uh, too often, then obviously, I mean, that may, you may need to pause the database system very often, and checkpointing also take resource and slow down the performance of the system. But if you do it uh, very infrequently, then it kind of defeats the purpose of checkpoint, right? Because if you do it very infrequently, then the log can still get pretty big, and after you recover from a crash, you may still need to read a lot of uh, data or log records to put the system, system back into a correct state. All right, so that's the high level idea of checkpointing. And we'll talk about a, uh, the efficient way to do this later in this class, okay? So uh, for today's lecture, what we are going to focus on would be the second part of this logging and recovery process, essentially uh, the recovery algorithm. <laughs> So the, uh, the very canonical algorithm, right, like a very fundamental algorithm that uh, to perform this uh, recovery uh, step will be called ARIS, right? It's like in short of algorithms for recovery and isolation exploiting uh, semantics. So essentially it's, uh, it's, uh, it's formally proposed in this paper uh, from uh, IBM uh, DB2 research and in early 90s and especially from this guy called Mohan. And actually, this document is, is pretty long, right? It covers various aspects of this logging and recovery process in various scenarios. For example, you, you are using different concurrency control mechanism, et cetera. Right? So this page, is, this document is like 50, 60 pages. And, and so in this class, obviously, we are only going to focus on the uh, high level, the main intuition behind this um, algorithm instead of everything. Right? And I would also say that um, most of the uh, contemporary uh, database recovery algorithm would actually, uh, most of them would be based on that, or 
using a very similar mechanism to that. And furthermore, uh, this paper is actually not the that does not represent the first implementation of Iris either, right? So even before this paper comes out, there are some uh, people using uh, similar ways to do log and recovery already. But it's just uh, this paper is, uh, is, is generally seen as the uh, first one that formally organized everything, right? Trying to put all the rules and the scenarios in a principled fashion and organize all the uh, mechanism and details for you. So people see, people generally view this as the uh, first formal document. Uh, that pro proposed this uh, ARIS mechanism, all right? So <laughs> the main idea of ARIS is, it's, it's, it's kind of, we were already kind of like hinted this uh, throughout our lecture from last class and we talk about checkpoint. Essentially, there are just uh, three main parts of ARIS, right? The first would be that logging part, I mean, especially it would use the right head logging that we talked about last class. And just to remind that right head logging is actually a still and a no false policy, right, in terms of buffer pool management. And then, assuming that you, the database system crashed at, at some point, then after the system come back from the crash, what Aries will do would be first to reapply or redo all the changes of the committed transaction, right? So to make sure that for all the committed transactions, their durable changes onto the disk are brought back to the database system if, if they, they have not been, uh, the, 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 the dirty page, pages of those changes have not been flushed before the crash, right? So redo phase to reapply all the changes of committed transaction. And then after that, it will just be a undo phase, assuming that there will be some uncommitted transaction, but if their dirty pages have already been flushed to the disk, the undo phase will just uh, uh, I mean, restore all those changes. And then after that, the IBAV system will be back into a uh, correct and consistent state. And one thing to note that is that in, in redo phase, right, we just uh, reapply all the changes, but in undo phase, we actually need to record what values that we have been undone as additional log records as well, right, because uh, we want to know that what, uh, what, uh, what things we have uh, restored, what things we have not restored, and especially in the case that there might be a crash while you are trying to recover, right? So they can kind of like a recursive crash scenario. In that case, after we come back, we especially want to know what, what undo we have done and what we have, not, what we have not done, and then help us to resolve this kind of a recursive crash scenario correctly, okay? But that's kind of like an additional thing to note here. So today's agenda, uh, a couple few steps. First, we have to establish a few concepts and the metadata the database system needs to record beyond just uh, the uh, basic elements of right head logging we talked about last class, uh, especially for every log record, we actually need to talk about the concept uh, called a log sequence number. And then we will talk about a, what operations exactly we need to do when transaction commits and abort, abort so that we can later on use errors to recover. And lastly, sorry, next we'll talk about a little bit uh, optimized version of checkpointing. Right, and lastly, we can talk about this uh, ARIS recovery algorithm specifically. All right, cool. <laughs> so uh, first of all, this one very, very important um, concept or additional meta information we need to add to every single log record is this thing called log sequence number. Right? It's, it's a very, very important thing to coordinate everything, pretty much everything in the ARIS algorithm. And I mean, essentially this would be a globally unique number uh, for every single log record that would always keep increasing, right? Just only increase. And then uh, lastly, beyond, I mean, uh, this, uh, besides every single log record, different components of the database system will actually keep their own um, watermarks, if you will, of different versions of log, this log sequence number so that different components of a system can coordinate with each other based on their version of log sequence number so that they can perform this um, log and recovery process or ARIS algorithm correctly. Right? So like I mentioned, uh, I think a few lectures before, both concurrency control and the logging or recovery, they actually, even though they are independent components, they actually need to coordinate many other components uh, in that database system as well so that uh, they can perform their uh, functionality and guarantee the acid process uh, property. Specifically, right, <laughs> there are quite a few uh, different places that uh, in the database system that they need to keep uh, different watermarks of this log sequence number, right? And I, I just uh, demonstrated their name, their location, and the definition here. So let me 
go through this uh, one by one. So the first will be called flushed LSN. It just the database system just maintain this number somewhere in memory, where it just indicates what will be the latest uh, uh, log record, what will be the LSN of the uh, latest log record that, that you have written on the disk, right? It's like what you have flushed. The second uh, and the third page uh, LSN and rec LSN, that would all be associated with a page, okay? So the page LSN will just be uh, indicate the LSN of the uh, latest uh, log record that update this page, right? That so what will be the most recent uh, uh, modification uh, to this page and what's the associated log record number. And then the rec LSN, the third one, would be the oldest update to that page since it was last flushed. So essentially, every time you flush a dirty page onto the disk, you're going to reset this rec LSN. And then uh, next time, if there's any modification did to that page, you are going to put the log record, I mean, associated with the, the log LSN associated with the, uh, that modification to that, uh, to this rec LSN number. And then the rec LSN is not going to be updated until next time you flush this dirty page back to disk again, right? And then the next one will be called the last LSN. Essentially, it will just be the uh, LSN of the uh, latest uh, log record associated with a specific transaction. Right? So that's stored along with uh, the transaction. The last one will be called master record. Again, it's still an LSN. It's actually on disk, but this LSN just represents the, uh, the log record where you take the checkpoint, right? What would be the LSN of the latest checkpoint log record, all right? Any question about these basic concepts? Because we are going to use them all over at this class. Cool. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of like uh, summarize the important elements about what we talk about, right? So for uh, every uh, page LSN, uh, that's, uh, that's actually the uh, latest uh, uh, log record that updated, that contains the update to that page. And that is going to be updated every time you update the log record. And the flush LSN would be the I mean, biggest LSN you written to the disk. Uh, then, oh, one important uh, property that we want, we want to uh, keep maintain is that every time we write some a page to the disk, we must ensure that the page LSN is actually uh, smaller than or equal to the flush LSN, right? We use that property to ensure that before we write any change to a dirty page, uh, back to the database content onto the disk, we want to make sure the log records that contains that change would be on the disk first, right? Because otherwise, if, the, if we uh, write a change, write a change of a dirty page back to the database before the log uh, uh, show up uh, onto the disk, then if the database system crash in between, then we don't know whether the data on data actually in the in the database content, whether that's correct or not, or because we don't have associated log records. So by ensuring this property, we can ensure that uh, we have log records onto the disk first before we can flush a dirty page that contains the changes associated with that, that log record uh, onto the disk. All right, make sense? Cool. <laughs> so to give you uh, a realization of this, right, what's going on here? So hey, say here, um, we have uh, I mean, different components. The first would be, uh, the tail of the right-hand log in memory, and as well as the buffer pool also in memory, right? And then on the right, I'm demonstrating that uh, there's this right-hand log, uh, right log file on disk, as well as the uh, pages uh, and the master, rec master record LSN number on disk as well. So uh, first of all, right, for each log record, there will be a log sequence number associated with it, and it's always increasing, right? <laughs> and then uh, second of all, there will be a page LSN as well as um, Rec LSSN associated with every page in the database, all right? And then next, when uh, we, every time we uh, flush a, 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 a page, let's say onto the disk, we are going to uh, update the flushed SSSN. In this case, we are just, we are just uh, have the flushed SSSN to be equal to 16, right? Because that's the latest. Next, for the master record, that will be just be uh, record the LSN of the latest checkpoint on the disk. All right, makes sense. <laughs> so let me give you some example about a, when can we uh, flush a page onto the disk, right? Say here I have a uh, log record, right? That's, so not log record. So here we have a, assuming that we have a dirty page pointing to uh, this uh, log record uh, 12, 
would be would be its page LSN. In other words, the latest change to this page would come from log record 12. Then can we flush this record or not? If our buffer pool want to evict page, we can, right? Because it's uh, smaller than the uh, latest LSN uh, 16. All right. Then on the other hand, assume that this page LSN of this page is pointing to uh, something still in memory. Can we flush this page? Not, right? Because we haven't flushed the log record yet. Uh, essentially, this, with this property, we can guarantee that. Okay. Cool. So now, how do we uh, actually? Uh, well, essentially, that's, that's actually a little bit similar uh, to what we have discussed before, right? So uh, all, the, all the log records will have a log sequence number, and every time you uh, modify some page with a transaction, you update the page LSN, and every time you uh, write uh, a, a page of log records onto disk, you will, you will renew the flushed LSN as well, right? So uh, that's kind of like summarize the example we have talked about, okay? Any question uh, so far before we talk about the uh, additional operation we need to do while we are executing transactions. Okay, cool, let's continue. So now, what will be the additional uh, operations or metadata we need to maintain while we are executing transactions with this uh, log sequence number? So uh, for the uh, purpose of discussion today, right, we are just actually going to, we're not going to look at SQL queries, we're just going to look at the read and the writes, uh, followed by a commit and abort for each single transaction, and we are going to assume some uh, simple scenarios. Again, the Aries algorithm can work, can, can work even though these assumptions break, right? For example, it can work with the different concurrency mechanism, but again, we are not going to talk about everything, so for the discussion, for the purpose of discussion today, we are going to assume that all log, log records would fit into a single page, and we are going to assume that when a system write to a page onto the disk, that write is atomic, right? <laughs> and next, we are going to assume that we use a, a single version concurrency control a mechanism, and we use the strong strict two-phase locking to guarantee the concurrency. And lastly, I mean, we use this still and no false buffer pool management with right hat locking. All right, that's for the purpose of discussion today. Cool. So first of all, what do we need to do when a transaction commit? That's actually uh, the uh, more straightforward case. <laughs> so we, we sort of also hinted about this in the last lecture. Essentially, we need to just first write a commit record uh, to the log, to the end of the log, and then we are going to uh, ensure all the uh, logs, log records of this transaction from begin, including all the changes up to the commit, are flushed to the disk, right? And then, I mean, uh, this could contain many log records. And after that, we can already tell the client that, or the outside world, this transaction has been uh, successfully committed. And then lastly, actually uh, not for the purpose of the correct commit for the transaction, but for additional bookkeeping purpose, we are actually going to have a additional transaction in the record append to the end of the log after we have resolved any um, remaining task of this transaction, if you will. So essentially, after the uh, transaction commit and we flush everything, we can already tell the client the transaction has committed. But there could be cases that in order for the uh, internal mechanism or the Aries algorithm to work, especially to work in an efficient way, we are going to, we may keep the log records uh, in memory for a while, right, to do some additional tasks. And uh, if we finished everything with processing uh, the log records of this transaction, we are just going to append this transaction in. And at that point, we can already blow away all the log records associated with the transaction. So this is only for internal bookkeeping purpose. Uh, it's not uh, necessary for the transaction to commit, and we don't have to flush that immediately uh, either. All right, that's for transaction end. So, <laughs> give you a simple illustration here. Uh, again, uh, this like a similar example where, but we only have uh, one uh, transaction uh, T4, begin, do some modification, and then commit, all right? So uh, when this uh, transaction uh, commit, what you do is that it would flush all these log records, right, within, uh, when containing this transaction onto the disk. And next, obviously because it has written log records onto disk, it would renew this flushed LSN to be 15, right, which would be the, the latest log records. <laughs> and what we do next is that after a while, it, again, it may need to uh, retain these log records in memory for some additional task, but assume that after a while it finished 
all the things related to the log records, right? Then it will just uh, append this transaction end records at the end of this uh, right header log tail. And then now it can just uh, blow away all the log records in memory. All right? Cool. So <laughs> the next transaction when transaction abort, what we need to do is that, again, similar to what we have talked about, when transaction abort, all we need to do at a high level is just to undo the changes of a particular transaction based on the uh, log records, right? And uh, this actually a little bit similar to what we need to do when we come back from a crash, right? Because when we come back from a crash, if there are records of uncommitted transaction in the log, we still need, we also need to undo all those changes, right? So the transaction abort process would have some similarity to the uh, recovery process. And then one, Additional information, this is actually not required, but for efficiency reason, uh, one additional reason we are going to, sorry, one additional information we are going to keep in the uh, log records to accelerate uh, this undo process will be some uh, information called previous LSN, right? <laughs> so essentially, previous LSN, as the name suggests, just contains the log sequence number of the uh, previous log record generated by that transaction. So essentially, with this previous LSN, we can sort of chain all the log records generated by a specific transaction together to be a linked list, right? So, so now, when we need to abort the transaction and undo all the changes, we can just follow this linked list. So this is only for efficiency reasons. I mean, for correctness, you don't have to do that, right? You can, you can just scan all the log records and figure out what would be associated with this transaction. All right? Make sense? So a illustration of this uh, abort process. <laughs> so here we can notice that in addition to the uh, log sequence number of each individual uh, log record, we also have this uh, previous LSN, which would indicate what would be the LSN of the previous log record generated by this uh, specific transaction, right? As in now, right, say uh, we have this transaction, again, still T4, but instead of commit this transaction, we see that this transaction has abort. So uh, what you do is that we'll just uh, follow this uh, linked list and then I mean, undo all the changes of this transaction one by one, right? So again, similar to what we have talked about before, uh, uh, when we uh, finish everything processing this transaction, right, finish all the undo and uh, address all the uh, remaining uh, tasks, no, nobody else would use this information in the transaction. We can append this uh, transaction end here, right? And obviously, what would be uh, would be the important is that what would happen when we uh, perform this uh, this undo operation, and then like I mentioned before, so beyond just undo all these uh, log records, one additional thing we have to do is that we have to log the, the undo we have done to the database system while we are performing this undo for a transaction. Again, it will be especially useful if the transaction crash while you are trying to uh, abort or undo a certain uh, operation, so that after we come back during that time, we know where we are, okay? So to uh, specifically talk about uh, what we need to record, that's good, it's usually going to be something called composition log records, right? So apologize if I'm kind of like uh, uh, overloading these different terms, but I mean, Aries is actually a, a mechanism that is a little bit complicated, so we need to establish all this metadata information before we talk about the specific recovery algorithm, okay? <laughs> so uh, this composition log records is essentially, uh, like I said, would record what undo operation you have done to have a system, right? Especially, especially while you are trying to uh, restore the content in a page, in a buffer pool to your original value. And then in this undo uh, log record, sorry, in this composition log records or CRR, what field would, 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 or additional information we need to put there would be something called undo next pointer, right? Essentially, this undo next pointer in the composition log record will just be the log six number of the uh, next log record to be undone, right? So this um, uh, composition log record would also be I mean, form a, a linked list, right? So that we can it can accelerate uh, our uh, uh, our operation when we are trying to come back from a, a, a crash. Okay, and then the uh, last thing uh, to note that is that un unlike this uh, this uh, what's it called um, this normal redo normal log records that we actually need to uh, make sure that we uh, flush all of them 
right, before we can flush the, a, a dirty page. And then for this uh, CLR, right, we can actually edit them to the log records, right, but we don't really need them to be flushed before we tell the outside world that this uh, transaction has aborted, right? So essentially, when a transaction abort, we can immediately, I mean, tell the user the transaction has abort, but we don't need to wait for the undo operation to finish and all the uh, CLR to be written to the disk, right? That we don't need to guarantee, unlike when transaction commit, okay? So here, <laughs> to give you a uh, specific example, here, just because for space reason, we are not going to show you uh, this uh, demonstration of these uh, graphs, uh, graphics before, right? So we, here, we can only show you uh, a table of all the records, all the log records with the uh, associated information. So here, we have uh, this transaction, I mean, begin, and then did an update, and then followed by a abort, right? And we have the log sequence number, and then freeze previous log sequence number that chain them together. And then when, after this transaction abort, we can already tell the outside world transaction abort, but what we do, do, do is that we will need to undo all the changes, and as well as generating those composition log records that contains all those changes, right? And then in these composition log records, right, for example here, these log records would be just be uh, corresponding to the um, earlier updates for the uh, log record two, and then uh, what it has is that I mean, instead of have the before and after value with the modification, it will just have the, its reverse, right? Essentially, we are going to restore the original value, so the new value uh, changed by the transaction now become the after value, right? And then lastly, we have this undo next log sequence number that will be uh, pointing to the uh, next record that we are going to uh, process in this uh, uh, transaction abort or undo uh, mechanism. All right, and then here, because this transaction only did one update before it abort, so this undo next record will just be pointing to the beginning of the transaction, right? And then after we process that, that we already finish the entire abort process, and we don't really need any of the log records uh, in memory anymore, right? Because we finished processing them, so we can append the transaction end record right here, and then undo next will just be a null pointer. All right, make sense? Cool. Any uh, questions so far? Okay, okay. So I mean, essentially, I mean, this is kind of like a, a summarize of what we talked about before, right? We for, when, we when a transaction needs to abort, we first write the uh, abort record to the end of the transaction, right? And then we will um, replay, oh, yeah, replay all the log records um, based on this uh, uh, previous log record number that we chain together in the linked list and restore all the changes of this transaction. And while we are doing that, we are going to write the uh, composition log record. And finally, uh, we just uh, write this uh, transaction end log records at the end when we finish everything, right? And lastly, uh, this composition log record doesn't really, it never needs to be undone, right? Because it's just, it should undo a effect uh, that we want to uh, want to uh, remove from the database system. So we don't need to undo a undo record log record, right? Doesn't make any sense, all right? So, so far we have talked about uh, these uh, metadata uh, we need to maintain, right? Especially log sequence number as well as the additional operation or information, information we need to keep with while we are committing our aborting transaction. Now we are going to talk about one optimization we, 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 we are going to do for the checkpointing. And lastly, we will get to the recovery mechanism, all right? So, I mean, we have talked about this uh, checkpointing idea so that we don't need to uh, grow uh, our log record forever, right? So before we talk about the fuzzy checkpointing, just to give you some uh, examples of uh, non-fuzzy or non-optimized checkpointing right before that. So one specific version of uh, uh, non-fuzzy checkpointing or unoptimized checkpointing would be that when the database needs to take a checkpoint, it can just pause everything, right? Similar to what we talked about before. But in addition to pause everything, what it can also do is that it can also wait for all the active transaction, current active transaction to finish, right? It can do that, and only after that, it can flush all the data pages onto disk. So this is even, even like more simple than the early example we talk about, but the, the, obviously the database system needs to wait much more time, but the benefit of this is that this would make the recovery much easier, right? Because this algorithm guarantee that while we are taking the checkpoint, everything before this checkpoint, all the transactions before the checkpoint have committed, and there's nothing else, right? So after we come back from this, from a crash, right, potential crash, we don't need to look at 
anything before the checkpoint, right? Only need to look at things after and everything before the checkpoint can be immediately thrown away, right? So this is like a very simple uh, checkpointing, but then the problem, like, as you can already see, is that it needs to wait, it needs to store the database system, and it also needs to wait for the running transaction to finish in this case. And I mean, in, in today's world, especially for some uh, analytical database workload that would, for example, sometimes could take, uh, read all the tuples in a table with uh, 10 billion rows, I mean, the transaction may run for hours, right? It's not that uncommon. So with that, the checkpoint team would store the database system for a couple hours, right? Which would be obviously bad. So a slightly better version of this, uh, this naive checkpointing with that <laughs> would be that you store pause the transactions, but instead of uh, waiting uh, these uh, transactions to finish, you just stop them in between, right? So there could be some modifications of uncommitted transactions in the database system right now, but uh, you don't really try to wait, them for, wait for them to finish, right? Because they can take forever. And then for writing transactions, sorry, for read-only transactions, if you know the transaction is read-only, uh, you can just let them to continue as normal, right? So what it can, what this will do is that, I mean, as I illustrated here, uh, you can have, like, for example, two uh, additional, uh, two separate threads. Again, for simplicity, right? We just assume one thread doing the checkpointing, the other thread just uh, execute processing the transactions. So assume that you have a writing transaction. Right, that already modified a page, page three, uh, in this uh, database. And then now you want to take the checkpoint instead of wait for this transaction to finish, which you don't know how long time it will take, it can first, it, well, wait, not first, it can immediately pause the execution of this transaction, right? Don't allow it to do anything else or do any more, more modification. But then you can just uh, directly use this checkpoint thread to scan through everything and then write everything uh, onto the disk. And then later on, after the checkpoint finish, this transaction can continue and do other modifications, right? But then the obvious problem with this uh, checkpointing approach is that now on disk, right, you have flushed three pages onto the disk. Two of them are just kind of like a consistent state with only modifications from a committed transaction, right? But then there's this additional page, page three, you flushed it onto the disk, I mean, before the checkpoint, I mean, while doing the checkpoint, but then it has values of uncommitted transaction, right? So it's not, if, for example, transaction, this transaction abort, then this value is, is incorrect, right? It shouldn't be there. So uh, you, we have to have additional mechanism uh, to deal with that situation. And the uh, well, additional mechanism, or especially the additional uh, information that we need to keep track with uh, to deal with this, this situation when we come back from a crash would be uh, essentially two parts. One part would be uh, something called active transaction table, which means that while we are taking checkpoint, we just keep track of what will be the transactions that are still running active, right? And the other would be called dirty page table, right? We also want to know what will be uh, the pages that would be the dirty pages that contain the changes from uncommitted transaction. All right, that's like a two additional information we want to keep up with uh, to help out with uh, this uh, scenario, okay? So first, this active transaction table, what, this, what it has is that first it will have a ID for every single transaction to be recorded or for every active transaction, right? Transaction that are still running, not committed, not abort. <laughs> and then it will have a status code of the transaction as, as a last LSN, right? Which would indicate what would be the most recent log sequence number uh, with the log records uh, that contains the changes of this transaction, right? We talked about this L last LSN before already. And then for when a transaction commits or boss, we essentially finish, we will just remove a transaction from this active transaction table. And then there are three possible states of every single transaction. The first is running, is executing certain stuff. The second is committing, a right? transaction is trying to finish before uh, you remove it. And the third one is called a cand candidate for undo, which is actually the default state of a transaction if a transaction is not running or not committing. Because what, we're going to, what the database system is going to assume is that it's going to assume every transaction can be, can be, can be abort and can need to be undone, right? Because the database system can crash at any time, right? And before the system crash, any active transaction can abort and can be undone, right? So the, this, uh, this last state, this uh, candidate for undo would actually be the default state for any transaction in this active transaction table, right? 
And next, for the dirty page table, we sort of already discussed, it will just uh, keep track of what will be uh, the pages uh, that contains values from, uh, uh, contains modifications, right? Because dirty page contains modifications from uncommitted transaction, right? And then we need to keep track of that. And it also needs to record the rec LSN of every dirty page, right? Which would be the, uh, the oldest uh, modification applied to that specific page, specific page after, since, since the last time it has been flushed onto the disk. All right, cool. So to uh, just uh, give you a concrete example of this, right? <laughs> Assuming that we have these uh, three transactions, uh, T1 and T2 and, and T3, and we uh, did two checkpoints in this case, right? So uh, before this uh, check, first checkpoint, Right, we assume that uh, transaction T1 has already finished and then uh, transaction T2 is still running, right? <laughs> then in this case, in the active transaction table or in abbreviation ATT, it will only be a T2, right? And then in the dirty page table or in abbreviation DPT will just be the uh, page 22, which will be the dirty page, right? And then that will be this uh, first checkpoint. And then as another example for the second checkpoint, uh, when that happened, the transaction T2 has already committed, right? So only transaction T3 is running in ATT, and then the dirty page of T3 would be uh, page 33, all right? So that's the uh, basic concepts of ATT and the DPT, and then uh, this uh, little bit better checkpointing mechanism, right? But of course, right, this, uh, the, the problem with this uh, slightly better checkpointing is that you will still need to uh, store all the current running or uh, writing transactions right, when you are doing this uh, checkpointing. And depending on uh, this, uh, the, the duration of the checkpoint, right, how much records you need to write to disk, this store could be long. Right? So what, was there any even better mechanism that would allow us uh, to still executing these transactions, uh, keep modifying the dirty pages, or not dirty pages, keep modifying pages in my buffer pool and while I'm doing this checkpointing. Right? So the answer is, the so fuzzy checkpoints, right? Essentially, we can do that. And the mechanism that help us to do that, in addition to the ATT and the DPT we already talked about, would just be that we're actually going to write two uh, checkpoint records in this case, right? So in addition to the original checkpoint record with ATT and DT, DPT, we're going to write a additional checkpoint begin records to indicate when I begin my checkpoint. So at that point, I already have a access to the state of the database uh, before everything starts, right? And then I start to take my checkpoint based on what's already exist uh, before this, I write this uh, begin checkpoint record. And then after the checkpoint end, we're going to, I mean, say, notify or note that the checkpoint has already finished, but then we just append this additional ATT and DTD DPT information. And with a combination of these uh, two information, we can allow uh, transactions to still be modifying records while we are doing the checkpoint. All right. <laughs> so uh, to uh, give to 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 uh, to give you a more uh, specific uh, implementation or instruction, every time when uh, the transaction or when the database system is trying to uh, uh, take a checkpoint, obviously it's going to write the begin checkpoint record first, right? But then after the checkpoint finishes. Instead of uh, write the uh, number of the end checkpoint record, it will actually only record the LSN of the begin checkpoint uh, to reflect it to be the to be uh, reflected it, reflected to be in the master record, right? Because that's when the checkpoint starts, and we are only guarantee that we are writing a consistent state of the database system before the checkpoint starts, right? While we are doing the checkpoint, some other transaction can still be modifying the database system. So the records written later could be uh, dirty, right? So in the master record, we are only going to record the LSN of the uh, checkpoint begin uh, log record, all right? And then well, for any transactions uh, that starts after uh, the transaction, the, the checkpoint begin record, we're actually going to ignore them from the uh, checkpoint end record, right? We'll, we'll have additional mechanism to recover them uh, after we uh, finish, we have, after we come back from a crash. But then in this uh, ATT and DTT, DPT table, we don't need to include the active transactions, only start after this uh, checkpoint begin, all right? Because the master record only has the uh, log LSN before that. So to give you this specific example, 
when uh, this uh, checkpoint begin, then the system start to look at all the log records before that, as well as look at all the uh, pages in the buffer pool before this checkpoint begin and try and start to write all of them onto the disk, right? And while in the meantime, some other transactions can start and, and this existing transaction can still make modification, right? And then after the database system has flushed out everything before checkpoint begin, then it will just uh, record a checkpoint end record that contains first the um, active transaction, right, which would be T2 before the checkpoint begin, as well as the dirty pages that uh, modified by this uncommitted transaction, right, which would be T2. Yes, please. So in this case, if T3 had modified uh, that page, it would be the dirty page, and if it modified it before checkpoint 10, yes. the T3 written would still be the same, it's page 11 and page 22. Yes, 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 yes. And for, for those things, we still need to handle that, but we'll handle that through uh, recovery, additional recovery mechanism, yes. Okay. <laughs> So that's for a checkpoint. And actually, any additional question before we are actually going to jump into the uh, recovery mechanism right next? Any question? Okay. So that's essentially for the checkpoint. <laughs> and with all this uh, information established, right, with all this log sequence number, uh, different redo on the records, as well as the information in the checkpoint, finally, we can talk about how we recover the database system back to a correct state, assuming that there is a crash. So. <laughs> Again, we have mentioned this before, but just put you uh, into the context to remind you a little bit. Uh, there are essentially three phases. The first phase, which we haven't talked a lot about, is that there will be an analysis phase, where we're actually going to read every single Red Hat log record from the starting of this uh, must record number, uh, which would be the uh, begin, checkpoint begin record number. Uh, since the last, last, time, last time I do a checkpoint, we're going to read every single record from there and then reestablish the uh, correct activity transaction table as well as the dirty page table. Exactly like the other student asked, there are certain transactions that we may have not included yet, right? We have to restore them back correctly. And then second phase would be the redo phase. Uh, we are going to, I mean, after the first analysis phase, right, we are going to determine a point in time in my history of log records that we are going to reapply every single change in the log records, even including transactions that has committed and transactions have aborted. So the reason we want to do that is that there are mechanisms that we could abort, uh, we could uh, skip the changes of aborted transaction, but then in many cases, in order to uh, apply, to ensure that the system apply uh, all the changes correctly and then restore the system back into the correct state, oftentimes it's just uh, easier and straightforward that you just uh, apply every single change and in order so that you put the, put the database system back into the state right before it crash with all the info, with all the changes from a committed and uncommitted transaction, and then you clean up things afterwards, right? Because while you are, if you want to skip the change of uh, aborted transaction, it's possible, but then while you are doing that, you, you kind of like lose the normal order of the changes of different transactions, and then you have to do quite some other uh, operation to make sure that things are correct. So for this uh, redo phase, again, in a uh, more straightforward version of ARIES, we're just going to reapply all the changes, including committed as well as aborted transaction. And then last, in this undo phase, we're going to come back right, and look at what transactions I mean, have, have not committed right, before the crash, and then restore the changes of this transaction, and then we can put the database system back into the correct state. All right? That's the high level idea. So to, uh, just to realize this thing a little bit, right? it's, it's, it's the same thing as I talk about, but just to realize this for you, every time we uh, recover from a crash, right, as, as illustrated in the, on the right-hand side, assuming that we have lots of record and then it crashed, we're going to first look at what would be the uh, last begin check, checkpoint uh, LSN, I mean, reflected in the uh, master record number onto the disk, right? And then we are going to first look at that, and then assume that, I mean, this is, is the uh, begin checkpoint uh, number. Well, we are going to look at all the records after that, and then determine what will be uh, the active transactions uh, during this whole process, what will be 30 pages, as well as what will be uh, the uh, log records that I need to go back to to reapply all the additional changes, right? 
And then after that, we're just going to go into this redo phase, and then we are going to repeat all these uh, actions from committed and uncommitted transactions that may have not been uh, reflected uh, into the uh, content of the database yet, right? So more specifically, <laughs> we'll get to the details later, but more specifically, we are going to look at the smallest uh, REC LSN. Remember, the REC LSN is the uh, oldest LSN since the last time I flushed the disk, right? So after I flush a page to the disk, then I have, before I flush it for the next time, this REC LSN would indicate the oldest change, right? So for, for all those oldest change, if I take the oldest of all these oldest change, then in the my dirty page table, then that would essentially be the smallest starting point that I need to redo all the changes, right? Because all the changes before that from this uh, LSN, especially REC LSN, we know that they have all been flushed to disk, all right? And then that will just be the redo phase, rewrite all the changes. <laughs> Lastly, for undo change, we are actually going to find, I mean, it's kind of straightforward, what will be the oldest uh, log record of the uh, active transaction uh, before crash? And we can get that through our analysis phase. And then we are just going to undo uh, all the changes for these uh, transactions that are still active when we crash. Right, make sense? Nice. So <laughs> for this uh, analysis phase, Right, quite a few uh, information that we need to uh, keep. Uh, again, is you would, we will start from the master record, or in other words, the begin checkpoint of the last uh, successful checkpoint. And then every time you find a, a transaction end record, you'll just uh, remove uh, the uh, transaction ID or whatever identifier you have uh, from the actual act active transaction table, right? Because you know that no matter whether it committed or aborted, you finished the processing of all of them. <laughs> and then <laughs> in all the other cases, Right? Then you would actually uh, add a, a transaction to this, uh, to this uh, active transaction table uh, with a status, with a default status undo if you see this uh, transaction for the first time or if the transaction is just still applying update. And then if, if you see a log record indicates a transaction commit, then you would just, uh, I mean, again, set the status of this uh, transaction in your active transaction table to be commit. And uh, lastly, Every time you see a update record, you will actually just uh, renew the uh, rec uh, LSN of that specific page uh, in reflected by the update record to be the um, LSN of that specific record. Right? So you will know what would be uh, the changes of different, uh, what would be the LSN uh, to the changes of the dirty pages in the dirty page table. All right. So that's the information you need to record. And again, with uh, this analysis phase we are going to recover the uh, transactions that we didn't record after the checkpoint begin, right? We'll include these active transactions in the in this analysis phase as well. And then at the end of the analysis phase, again, we'll have a two, uh, this uh, complete version of these two different tables. Active transaction table indicates what will be the active transactions, I mean, before the crash, and then dirty page will indicate what pages may or may not be written to the disk yet. I mean, it, it, it very well may already be written to the disk, but we just don't know yet, right? So uh, uh, we use data page table uh, that to keep track of the changes of all the commit uncommitted transactions, sorry, uncommitted transactions, all right? So here, I'll uh, give you this specific example. <laughs> Say that uh, we have a transaction begin at time 10, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> checkpoint begin at, uh, uh, at a log sequence number 10, and then after that, a transaction 96 come along, right, and then uh, I apply this modification, right? So that's the, uh, the time point. And then assuming that uh, we are scanning, uh, we are scanning this, uh, this um, right header log file after the crash, right? Assuming that we already come back from the crash and we are scanning this record, then transaction begin, I mean, there's nothing there. Then for the, uh, for the log, log record 20, right, with sequence number 20, we are just going to uh, record the uh, ID of this transaction in the active transaction table and the status of uh, this transaction by default, which is be undo, right? And then we are going to look at what will be the change of this transaction, right? In this case, a modification in page A, Oh, sorry, modification to A in page 33, I'm going to record uh, that page in the dirty page table as well as the rec LSN as that page as well, right, to be this uh, LSN of this particular log record, okay? And then after that, uh, we keep scanning, right, keep our analysis phase, say we, are in, we encountered uh, this uh, checkpoint end phase, right? Now we have some additional information that while we are taking this checkpoint, we already record, right? For example, when uh, we, before we 
issue the transaction, sorry, keep the transaction. Before we issue the checkpoint begin command, there may be another transaction, transaction 93, right? It may has already started, right? It may do some modification on different pages, etc. right? So in this um, checkpoint end record, we are just going to get those information back, right? Because if transaction 97 start from checkpoint begin and did some modification before checkpoint begin, then by only analyzing information after, we don't know that, right? So here we just add those additional information back. So now, transaction, we keep scanning this log record uh, at with log record of 40, we have uh, this transaction 96 commit, right? <laughs> so in this case, we're just going to uh, write, flip the status of the transaction 96 uh, to be commit, okay? And after a while, we see that transaction 96 actually has an end command, right? Which means that we already finished all the processing, tell the outside world, and no other things would need log records of 96, which is going to remove that from the active transaction table, and we don't need to deal with that, all right? All right, so that would just be the analysis phase. Any question? Okay. So now just a redo and undo phase. So they are actually uh, kind of a straightforward, right? <laughs> so uh, Read in the in the in the redo phase, we're just going to uh, reapply all the changes uh, of every individual log record since uh, since the beginning of the uh, smallest rec LSN we identify in all the dirty pages in my dirty page table, right? And then uh, again, there are techniques to uh, skip the unnecessary uh, read and write, especially from aborted transaction. But then uh, in this lecture, we are not going to talk about that yet. All right. <laughs> Then, uh, yeah, for, for, the, for the redo phase, uh, we're giving a... Oh, actually, actually, yeah, yeah. In, 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 in the redo phase, we actually, not only we have to uh, reapply all the changes, in the dirty page table, we also need to uh, keep track of what we have to do, and then we also need to uh, know what would be the uh, log sequence number of each uh, page, and especially, uh, we need to look at uh, the, uh, yeah, we need to, we need to look at what will be the pages in the dirty page table to decide whether we are going to apply this change or not, right? Because even though we say that we will still apply the uh, changes of the aborted transaction, but then there could still be cases that we didn't really uh, want to apply the change. Because for example, in some cases, right, in the dirty page table, this, uh, this uh, specific page reflected by this uh, log record may not even be there, right? So you should indicate that, I mean, this page is already being flushed to the disk, and even though there's a log record that I'm scanning, I, if it is not a dirty page, then I don't need to write that uh, back again anyway, right? That's one scenario. And the scenario scenario is that the uh, page could be in the dirty page table, but then the page's uh, log sequence number might be, uh, sorry, the, the, the log record that I'm looking at right now, right? Its log sequence number may be smaller than this page's rec LSN, right? In this case, in this case, we actually also know that there will be a future modification of this specific page, right? That would actually be the uh, latest, sorry, it would be the oldest modification to that specific page, and that I, I only need to apply that page, so that change, right? For everything that is uh, smaller, for every change that has a log sequence number smaller than the rec LSN, I don't really need to apply that change, right? Because uh, that has, all those changes have been flushed to the disk already, right? We don't need to apply them back again. And we can tell that through the pages uh, rec LSN, okay? So there's just a few scenarios where you can skip uh, the modification, right? But just keep in mind, we are, there's nothing that says whether this transaction is aborted or not, right? We still need to apply the change of aborted transaction, okay? So uh, lastly, right, to uh, the specific mechanism uh, to uh, finish this uh, redo phase, uh, just to talk about the specific implementation detail, right? In this case, we will first uh, reapply this uh, change of that log record, and next, we will set this uh, page LSN to be the uh, LSN of this specific log record, right? Because page LSN always reflect uh, to the uh, latest change applied to that specific page, right? And then there's no additional things we need to do, right? We don't need to flush additional uh, change records, log records, et cetera, because we, we already have this redo log records, right? So even though the transaction, sorry, even though the happy system crashed right now, we still have this log record in place already, right? We don't need to do anything else, uh, append any new records. And then after uh, everything finished, then for all the committed transaction, uh, for after 
everything in the redo phase are finished for all the committed transactions, we'll just uh, append these uh, transaction end lock records and then remove them from active transaction table. All right, make sense? Cool. So next, come to uh, this uh, undo phase. Uh, in the undo phase, again, it's, it's also kind of straightforward. Essentially, you are just going to like, look at what would be, what would all be, what would be the, all the uh, active transactions uh, that you have not committed after you finish the analysis phase, right? Essentially, that would be all the uncommitted transaction uh, when, at the time when the system crashed. And then you just look at uh, the uh, smallest uh, log record number among all those active transactions, right? And then go back in time and fetch the log records and then restore the changes of this uh, transaction uh, one by one, right? And then uh, again, like I mentioned before, for these log records, we have this uh, last LSN associated uh, with each log record, which would indicate what would be the previous change applied to each individual transaction. So we can use that um, accelerate this uh, replay process of every uh, individual on transaction that we need to undo. And also, we need to apply this uh, composition log record after every modification. All right, make sense? Any questions about uh, redo and undo? Oh, no question, cool. So now, uh, give you uh, this uh, example, especially uh, to show you uh, how this uh, log composition log record will look like in practice, right? <laughs> Say uh, we have this log record here and then the log content on the right, and then this uh, checkpoint, assume that we have a very fast checkpoint, right? Beginning and end. And then there are two transactions, T1 and T2, uh, did some uh, modifications and then abort right away, right? So <laughs> we'll assume, that, assume that we already finished uh, all these, um, what's it called? Uh, analysis and redo phase, right? Assume that we already finished all the analysis and redo phase. Now, when we, are start, when we start to do the undo, well, first we look at uh, this uh, transaction T1. It has not uh, committed when, when, when the, uh, it, it didn't commit, right? When this checkpoint finishes. So we will first undo these uh, changes of transaction T1, append this uh, CLR number, and then the log sequence number uh, of that transaction, which is be 10, right? That would be the, uh, next thing to, to be undone. And then after that, I mean, assume that transaction T1 only has this one uh, single modification, we just say, hey, we already finished processing uh, the changes of all this transaction, and then uh, this uh, transaction T1 has been successfully aborted, right? Yeah, this uh, previous LSN will just uh, indicate uh, where uh, in this uh, chain of log records you need to go back um, if uh, you need to uh, uh, reverse the modification of this transaction, okay? Okay, now assume that we have some uh, additional uh, changes uh, in this, uh, I mean, schedule of transactions, I mean, with uh, T3 modify something else, and then uh, T2, uh, I mean, come, come along and then uh, modify something else as well, right? Now we crash. So what do we do here, right? So give you a, so <laughs> again, so assume that we crash uh, this time, and then assume that I have uh, finished all these um, called redo uh, analysis and analysis and redo phase, right? Here I'm directly uh, showing you the results. We come back after this crash, right? I mean, for simplicity reason, we don't do the analysis here. Uh, then what we need to do here is that I'm showing you uh, this uh, active transaction table, right? Has two transactions, T2 and T3 still running. This dirty page table has all the dirty pages that I have analyzed, analyzed so far, all right? And then here, this, uh, yeah, this transaction uh, in this uh, active transaction table, because we keep updating this uh, last LSN of this table of these transactions, we can directly jump into the corresponding locations, right? To look at what will be the latest log records of those uh, active transactions. And we start the recovery from there, all right? And then here, say that uh, we first recover transaction T2, and then we'll just, uh, I mean, undo this uh, log, undo the changes corresponding to log record um, 60, right? And then uh, this would be a composition log record, we write for that, and then the uh, next undo would just point into the uh, earlier, earlier log record for that transaction, right? So on and so forth, we, um, we want to undo a transaction T3, and we apply the uh, composition log record, and now we already have this uh, T3 transaction end written here, right? And then we are going to uh, flush everything, and then uh, we see that uh, we have successfully uh, successfully uh, 
undo the changes of transaction T3, right? But then, assuming that I mean, before I can finish this, this whole process, right, to continue, assuming that the system crash right, right now, right? And then this would be actually be a repeated crash in this case because we, have, we hadn't finished all the process. So what will happen is that <laughs> everything here will be gone, right? I mean, then we have to actually, we didn't take a new checkpoint either, right? So we have to restart from the beginning of the checkpoint and then redo the analysis and then repopulate everything. But then what happened here is that because we have this uh, composition log record and especially at the end of, I mean, this uh, uh, undo process of transaction T3, we have this uh, transaction end record for T3. We know that we finished all the processing with T3, right? So we can just uh, directly remove transaction T3 from my active transaction table when the second time I come back from the crash and then I only need to deal with the uh, transaction T1 in this case. Oh, sorry, transaction T2 in this case. And then uh, we will be, which will be uh, much faster and then after that, T2 finish, we open the transaction end record for T2 as well. All right, make sense? Yes. Oh, make sense. Okay, okay. I thought you have a question. All right. Cool. So uh, just some uh, additional uh, questions uh, related to uh, this, uh, this transaction, uh, sorry, login and recovery process. The first is that uh, what does the database do if the uh, system, it crashes uh, during the recovery process, especially during the uh, analysis phase, right? So uh, before I just uh, put that on the slides, I don't know whether you have looked at it now. So any, any, any idea of, of what uh, the system need to do during analysis phase? Nothing, right? Because we didn't make any changes, we just run recovery again, right? We don't need to do anything. Again, similarly, what does the data system need to do uh, during the uh, cache recovery process in this redo phase, right? Again, nothing, right? Because for, for all the, everything that we, we, we are redo, we are going to redo, we already have the log records written, right? Even though we didn't finish, when we come back again for the next time, I mean, this redo record is still there, right? We can always apply them again, right? We don't need to do anything either, all right? So the next question, how can the database system improve its performance during the uh, recovery, during its recovery in the uh, redo phase? Well, then, uh, Assuming that uh, the database system is uh, actually not going to cr crash again, what we can do is that we can flush all the changes uh, in, the, in the background thread asynchronously, right? We have uh, different threads potentially uh, to help us to flush those changes and then uh, have, have to the, put the database system into, back into a correct state as efficient as possible, right? And lastly, how can a database system uh, improve its performance during its recovery, during its recovery in the undo phase? Right, so uh, there are uh, potentially uh, different uh, possibilities. The first would be that you can actually uh, lazily uh, roll back the changes before the uh, new transaction access the pages, right? So you can actually kind of sort of like uh, uh, stage all the changes of a, uh, to the page uh, before you apply them, because I mean, sorry, you can sort of stage uh, all the changes uh, to a page in a specific place, and then you, you don't really need to apply them right away, right? Because no transaction has access at the page yet. So when I re it's only that when the next time when, we act, when the system have resumed its normal operation, next transaction comes along and need that page, then at that time you can consolidate the changes uh, you apply to that specific page during crash and recovery with a new change. Right, and then you apply them once together so that you can only need to write them once, right? That's one option. The other is, is that you can, I mean, rewrite your uh, application logic a little bit so that you avoid long-running transactions. In that case, uh, after you come back from a recovery, then hopefully um, all your active transactions, all your active transactions are not really f too far away uh, since the beginning of a checkpoint, right? In that case, you're, you're, I mean, you can, you only need to look back at minimum as possible beyond the last checkpoint. If the transaction is too long, then even though you can do the checkpoint and the system can crash and recover correctly after checkpoint, you may need to look back very far away beyond last checkpoint, right? It kind of defeats the purpose of checkpoint. You still need to look at lots of data, all right? That's pretty much. Again, uh, to conclude a little bit, the main idea of this uh, logging and recovery process, we always need to uh, use this right ahead logging with these uh, arrays, right? Especially right ahead logging is a still and a no false policy. Very, very important concept, right? Would be show up in the homework, right? And uh, I mean, just uh, it was a fundamental decision point about the buffer management related to uh, crash and recovery. And next day, you can use uh, the fuzzy checkpoint to help accelerate the checkpoint processing, especially to uh, 
allow the system to perform these uh, executions with normal transactions, uh, especially writing transactions while you are doing this uh, checkpoint, right? And then uh, in the redo phase, you are going to redo everything since the uh, earlier dirty page based on the uh, rec LSN you know, of the pages in your dirty page table. And then for the undo phase, you are going to uh, look at the transactions uh, that all the active transactions uh, that are still running at a point uh, when you crash, right? And lastly, when you uh, undo things, right? Either when you are trying to undo things from an aborted transaction or trying to undo things while you are doing, while you, during the undo phase of the recovery process, you need to write these uh, composition log records, right? Then that records will help you uh, to accelerate your recovery process if you crash during your recovery, right? have repeated recovery then uh, you don't have to do things uh, over and over again. And then lock sequence number is the very, very important concept, right? I mean, it's, it's also like, it's the uh, fundamental things that coordinate uh, these, all these components to work together, right? And, and, with, and here, I list definition of previous LSM, page LSM, but definitions like a record LSM, master, L, master record LSM, all of them are very important for all those things to be able to uh, coordinate with each other, all right? So uh, that's all for this class today. And so far, we actually already talked about uh, all the things we want to talk about in this lecture about a single node database system. So, I mean, right now you can uh, go back and then build your own uh, single node database system already, right, to process data and guarantee asset property. And next class from uh, starting uh, next Wednesday, we're going to talk about a distributed database system. We have a few lectures on that. And then that's pretty much the semester, right? It's, it's fast. We'll have a guest lecture, we'll have a final review, and then the semester is done. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. See you next Monday. This the E I C K talking about the St. Ives brew. One through a can and two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Bust is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Or mic check, bust it. The fuse all set. Then grab a forty. The flim New Yorker snap his neck. St. Ives, take a sip and wipe your lips. Cue my forty's getting warm. I'm out. He got the tip. Drink it, drink it, drink it. Then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube. I put in much work with the BMT and the E trouble. Get us a St. Ives brew on the double.